When uh, I met my wife, Caroline, who's in the back up there with our children, uh, the second semester of our senior year in college, which turns out was a really good thing. Not that we met, that was a great thing. But it was great that we didn't meet until so late in our college experience on two different accounts. First, she tells me she's pretty sure if she had known me longer in college, she would have dumped me. <laughs> and on the other side, it's because Caroline had transferred to William and Mary our sophomore, what would have been our sophomore year, and she didn't live in student housing. She lived adjacent to Colonial Williamsburg in a second-story apartment that looked out over a Baskin Robbins. <laughs> it was Caroline I was interested in, but 31 flavors of Satan-tested sin tempting me in the wilderness... That's rough. It's a good thing it was only a couple months. Just as Baskin Robbins has 31 flavors of ice cream to sample, when we come to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we get four flavors, not quite Baskin Robbins. And Matthew and Mark and Luke and John each tell the same ancient story, but with different, like, nuances and flavoring in the mix. That's almost nowhere as true as it is in the beginnings and endings of the story. Each of the resurrection accounts gives us almost a vastly different tone to the storytelling. Mark's gospel, written first, is unrefined and rushed. It never made it to the editor. It just got published as a first draft. It leaves us largely out of breath, despairing with an unresolved question because there's no encounter with the living, risen Jesus. Luke is, well, Luke. And he's got a whole nother book to write. And so the resurrection is a transition moment with all the details, nothing left out, story after story after story. John's gospel is a favorite of our high and holy days because John, writing last, had plenty of time for the theologians to get to the script. It's laden with double meanings and fully fleshed out with a totally different perspective. Matthew sits kind of in the middle of this story. He's not quite Mark, all fear and trembling and no joy, nor is he an ad nauseum resuscitation like Luke or highfalutin as John. What Matthew does bring us is full-on, unbridled apocalypse. I'm sure you felt it, right? On Friday when we were reading from the Good Friday story, there were earthquakes when Jesus died, the temple curtain torn in two, the dead walked. I mean, it was a Walking Dead episode. Again, we're reminded of that today as an earthquake unrolls the stone. It's a flavor of the Genesis story which reminds us the earth is not simply something we trod upon, but is a co-creator with God. It's the earth that brings forth animals at God's invitation. It's the sea that brings forth fish at God's invitation. It's the earth that cries when Cain kills Abel. The earth is a living, breathing part of this creation unfolding, and it was quaking at his death and at his rising. By any measure of the word, Hollywood, or theology, this story is apocalyptic. And the apocalypse doesn't end, but it continues to strike like lightning, the scripture tells us. When the angel sitting on the now rolled away stone, but already 
empty tomb tells us about this invasion of heaven, of earth, the rules of life and death overturned. And we don't get time to figure out what we think about it. Matthew's gospel, apocalyptic as it is, is also urgent. Go quickly! The dominoes are dropping faster than we can catch up to, and we're supposed to catch it in Galilee, which is a long run. Jesus has work to do people to go, places to see, wrongs to right, and so do we. Do not be afraid, the angel says. Fear is the tool of death, and this story is about life. So don't let me scare you. I know who you're looking for, the crucified one. He isn't here. Death couldn't hold him. You're too late. He's on the road. Go quickly. Tell his disciples, get thee to Galilee. They run, and suddenly Jesus is there meeting them on the road, and they worship him. But Jesus doesn't have time for a worship service. It seems the resurrection is not a spectator sport. And so Jesus repeats, do not be afraid. Now go and tell my brothers and get thee to Galilee. Tag, you're it. There's a game at foot, and this game proceeds with quick pace. We don't have time to learn the rules. Jesus is on the loose. Life is on the loose. And I have to imagine that if I was there, I'd be gasping for breath, gasping and grasping and grabbing for anything firm to hold myself up with as I try to imagine what my eyes are seeing. I'd ask Jesus for a time out like a March Madness basketball game when the other team's on a 12-0 run and it's slipping through your fingers. It slipped through the disciples' fingers all of Holy Week. Despairing as it was, they finally feel like maybe now we know what will happen next. It's not good. Death is not good. But this death we understand and know, I have to imagine they thought this day would be slow. Full of grief, they would go to the tomb to do the burial preparations they had not been able to do because he died right as the Sabbath began on Friday night. They thought this day would be excruciating, and all of a sudden, instead of excruciatingly slow, they are shot out of a cannon. Jesus isn't in the tomb. Death didn't work. What? Jesus is on the road. Where? You've got to catch up to him. Wait! I'm still in the tomb trying to figure out what you mean, not dead. Matthew's story is apocalyptic and urgent, and we have got to get on board. Worshiping authentically through the Easter story is challenging in the 21st century. We don't really want to do the work of suspending our knowledge of how the story ends. We don't really have time to worship in all of those Holy Week services Andrew keeps telling us to come to. We show up for Easter and we wonder, what challenge are you talking about, Andrew? This is an old story. Its routineness is comfortable. We know all there is to know. And yet this Holy Week has been about things unraveling, and if nothing else, today just sped up the unraveling. Now even death doesn't work the way death did. And perhaps we need a little bit of Matthew's apocalypse. Perhaps we need a little breaking out of our domesticating the story, our domesticating God, because our lives are so messed up we can't be saved by a domesticated God. We need God to break out of the chains of our comfort and our safety and do some overturning, earthquaking healing of the fabric of creation. For all I'd love an easy coast, comfort, 
and tame, we need more. The world needs more. We may not have time for anything other than being a spectator. I don't know about you, but I've been tired for years now. We have descended this week into Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, descended not because these are atypical stories, but because they have deep and abiding relevance and prevalence to our daily lives, to the kind of distrust and betrayal that is fracturing, fracturing our society. The regularity in which we encounter hatred and enmity is a sad and tragic story we're too used to reading on the headlines of the newspaper, if you know what one of those is. On Good Friday, my colleague TJ from Southminster stood in that lectern and preached and reminds us that Jesus' death was not, sadly, once and for all, but it is a daily recurring event any time people in our lives are put to death, either literally or figuratively, when they are targeted by hate, when the protections of our society abandon them, when we ostracize them for not fitting our normative understandings of good and righteous. Whenever these acts occur, Jesus is crucified again. Such is his solidarity, such is his love. We descended into Monday, Thursday as leaves on a wind, unsure of what was going on. We no longer knew anything. I don't know about you, but every time I read those news stories, I'm a little more aware that I just don't know anything anymore. How did we get here? A COVID-exacerbated fracturing of our social contract has left us in disarray to trust the simplest things we knew. How do we find restoration? How do we break out of this tomb? We are adrift nowhere near shore with a rope in our hands, wondering what's next. The biblical story of Holy Week speaks into this reality, to just such a despair. This story speaks to a people like me, too tired to give time and energy to anything anymore, too distrustful to enter into a investing in the future, unsure of what we can believe. Fear rules. Do not. The story speaks about the dangers of love. When I think about the many tombs I see people in today, I see children fearing another school shooting. I see doctors fearing the practice of medicine made illegal. I see women feeling unvalued and unrecognized. I see unhoused neighbors demonized as drug addicts and criminals and hungry children with too few places willing to get them more than the first meal they might need. I see teenage identity crisis becoming harder and harder. I see the targeting of minorities made legitimate, anti-Semitism, transgender fear-mongering, refugees unwelcome, police being made the villains, name-calling across the aisles of our government, tearing, tearing, tearing apart our social fabric such that we cannot know how much or what or where or when we might move forward. We have no trust. Fear reigns. Do not be afraid. Love is a dangerous thing. Most of those tombs, to be honest, don't have to matter to me at all. I'm highly educated. I have a position of authority and trust. I bought my house in 2012 when the market was begging for me to buy a house. I'm a white male with a super mom wife and four pretty awesome kids. Most days. <laughs> you see, 
on the list of tombs that I can rattle off just the top of my head, most of them don't have to be any kind of concern to me as long as I decide not to care. My life isn't in the crosshairs. I ended up in a lifeboat, and mine has no holes. Maybe that wasn't true for others. Maybe that's not true for you. Maybe that's not true for most. But that doesn't have to be my problem, does it? There are large gaping holes in our society, tombs that we are placing people in for an early grave, and we, in reaction to it, have splintered into affinity groups created less by what we value and more by what we despise. We are not pursuing value-based ethics, but we are people on the attack. And into this state of affairs, I'm reminded of the words of Nicola Machiavelli, that jaded author of The Prince. It is much safer to be feared than loved, because love is only preserved by the link of obligation, which, owing to the baseness of humanity, is broken at every opportunity to our advantage. But fear? Fear will preserve you by dread punishment, which never fails. Machiavelli is a brilliant man. He understands the game afoot. He's simply playing for the other team. Love is dangerous because caring is a burden most of us wish not to pick up. I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the time. I'm exhausted. I can't do it all. And frankly, I don't know if I'm making any kind of difference. So why try? This week confronts that narrative and turns it on its head. My personal favorite theologian, Soren Kierkegaard, tells a parable. It goes something like this. If you were to hand someone a a sharp and kneaded double-bladed instrument, let's call it a scalpel, if you will, you would not do so in a way that you might procure a bouquet of flowers for your beloved nonchalantly. No, you'd hand it to them in a way that conveyed, you need this, but also, this is dangerous. Be careful and cautious, a sense of foreboding. It's precisely in this way Kierkegaard imagines that Christianity should be handed on. We should hand it to one another in a way that says this is simple and wonderful and joyous and the world needs it. Also, run the other way because it'll ruin your life. There's no greater sense to what that instrument truly is than the cross. The cross, which was for Rome an instrument of humiliation, excruciating pain, and death. The cross, which became for Christ the symbol of love that we are commanded to pick up daily. Christ tells his disciples, if you want to follow, do so carrying the cross, that two-edged instrument of life and death. Love, friends, is a many splendored thing, but it's dangerous because I'm going to teach you to care so much you'll give your life for the world just as Jesus did. The cross weighs heavy To love the world so deeply is heartbreaking, heart-rending. To love the world so deeply is maddening and vain. To reveal oneself so openly, so fully is about fear and trembling. Such vulnerability is more than we can ask. We hide behind locked doors. We hide behind tinted windows. We hide behind increasingly expensive and elaborate clothing to wall ourselves off from being vulnerable. Christ's love invites us to identify so unreservedly with the poor and the outcast, to identify so clearly with the marginalized and oppressed, that we are to be vulnerable to love and to throw our life away. That's the message of Friday. 
the consequence of unconditional love and unrelenting care for justice and equality is loneliness and death. But we get it all back. All back. And that's the message of today. Today's message is that for all that it feels futile and despairing, the tombs of this world will be harrowed by God's abundant life. The message of this day is that we will take ourselves into places of death and turn them into trampolines of life. And love is the way we do this. The message of this day is that we're to join Jesus who's tagged us and meeting us in Galilee to help Jesus turn the world upside down, to make the earth quake one act at a time and turn the unjust status quo upside down. We should not have come today bearing lilies and our Sunday best, but carrying shovels with knee pads to unearth and empty all the tombs. We're just getting started. It's an all-hands-on-deck event. Participate in the resurrecting of life. Love, this Sunday tells us, is the only instrument we need. Yes, it will be scary. Do not be afraid. And yes, it'll feel like throwing your life away. You will get back all that matters. And yes, you will never sleep well again for lack of worry. I can confess to that. But you won't be alone. There's just so much to do but it's like awakening from a monochromatic world into a rainbow splendor of God's creation. And it's rooting ourselves so deeply in life that parts of our body will tingle because they haven't felt that way in decades. Can you feel it in your bones, this yearning to lean in to life like that? This day is about turning graveyards into neonatal wards that we might be born again like Nicodemus, born again to make life sing even if we're off tune with potential for everyone. It's to go on a grand adventure, chasing after Jesus down the road to Galilee, carrying your shovel with you to dig people out and get dug out when it's you who are mired in the muck of this world. You are not alone. Jesus tagged us all. We can all care. Machiavelli may be right. It's safer to make people fear you than love you. But Jesus is on to the only way the world will be worth living in to become truly alive and risking it all for the possibility of being a place where we thrive. This is what God sat back on the sixth day and said, it's very good. It's also what makes God bang God's head against the wall. But God never stops hoping, God never stops living, and God never stops rescuing those who are entombed by life, entombed away from life. Jesus invites us on a journey to free creation, to free ourselves from the grasp of safety and fear and domestication, to let it be wild and woolly, alive and free, alive and free came across uh, a closing uh, remark of all places from Dean Kuntz, who writes about golden retrievers. Golden retrievers are not bred to be guard dogs, and considering the size of their hearts and their irrepressible joy in life, they're less likely to bite than to bark, less likely to bark than to lick your hand in greeting. In spite of their size, they think they're lap dogs. And in spite of being dogs, they think they're human. 
and nearly every human they meet is judged to have the potential to be a boon companion who might at any moment cry, let's go, and head out on a grand, a great adventure. Friends, may we be like golden retrievers this day. May we pick up our cross and our shovel with love and care and follow Jesus dominoing down the road to Galilee, risking reckless love that cares for everyone, yearning for a world set free to pursue our dreams in irrepressible joy at the little things and the big things and to turn the world upside down to be not afraid to seek not safety, but to love the world into a new day. May we be cataclysmically caught up in the abundant rising life of Easter that no one will not take notice and say, they're weird over there, but I want a little of that. May we see in everyone not an adversary to be contested, but a boon companion who might cry at any moment, let's go, tag, you're it. Amen.